podium. <laughs> All right. Hello, everybody. We're the last ones between you and lunch. So we'll uh, try and make up some time. <laughs> uh, my name is Matt Rhodes. I'm an application engineer at the MathWorks. With me today is Dan Painter. Dan Painter. I'm from NASA IVNV. Engineer. <laughs> So today what we have for you is a bit of a glimpse at something we're working on that's a, uh, a practical guide to software quality planning. How many of you in here, raise a show of hands, how many of you in here currently have a software quality plan that you work with on your projects? So that's less than half the room I'm seeing right now. <laughs> that's kind of scary. Um, of, of, of those of you who have plans, do you know it well enough that you understand all the concepts of operations that, you know, why you're doing everything it, that's involved with it? Okay. I don't see as many hands. <laughs> um, good things to think about. So we're going to show you that today. It is a work in progress uh, because this community is a good, uh, good community for, uh, you know, software that requires a high longevity, we would really like <coughs> your feedback also. So that's another reason we're presenting this today. So we definitely welcome your feedback. Um, and, and thirdly, you notice there's practical in the word. Um, you already have software that's complicated enough. So what we want to do is also make sure that this is easy for people, whether it be somebody uh, who's learning in school still, which is a known issue that we've been talking about already, uh, or also uh, being able to uh, you just have a team easily pick it up and understand where you're going with it a lot easier. Uh, you, know, you still have to adapt it. We're not giving you a set of instructions specifically. You still have to adapt it to your project and your needs. But what we want to do is make it so that it's easy to understand and have a path forward instead of being lost in the woods. All right? So funny story with this. I, I was actually uh, this was actually the impetus. Uh, a customer of ours actually uh, had this on their break room board, and it was actually the spur of the conversation to call us in the first place. <laughs> but uh, it, you know, I definitely didn't see enough hands in here. There should be more quality plans in place, and hopefully we can help you do that too. To start, we have a uh, definition here that I pulled from the, the Oxford Dictionary. <coughs> and uh, I want to zero in on the uh, two words in here, standard and measured. And uh, in fact, yesterday I heard uh, from the, the I believe it was the SARB group with uh, with uh, Lorraine talking about quality attributes, which is a fantastic thing to leverage. Uh, there are a whole bunch of other standards out there that uh, also get come into play when you're talking about quality. Uh, which ones to use, which ones to combine. It's uh, not always clear to people. It's not easy. So we're, tr we're trying to demystify some of that and give you a good starting point. If you're lucky, or unlucky, depending on the case, uh, you may have some industry standards that you have to use. Uh, so, you know, if you're in D178, you, you don't have as much choice, so it's a little more clear cut for you, but you still have some leeway in how you manage your process, because it's all about the process, right? Something else, actually, that was missing from this uh, is the how, right? And so that's also part of what we're trying to, to help you out with here. And some of those standards do help with the how, but not as much as it'd be nice. E even, even for the prescriptive ones, such as IE61508 and D178, they, they don't tell you as much how as most people would like. So we're going to have some posts like this that should be helpful for you, uh, help you understand you know, the sequence of things to go through and how, how it builds up the quality plan, why it's important uh, as you move along. Right? So one thing that's, that's going to come up is you know, you're looking at requirements. And so the, the requirements you have from your customer, there's, there's, some, there's some sleuthing to do. But uh, you know, at the end of the day, the software quality that you have should be fairly proportional to the, the software value that the customer has. So what is, what is the value? Example here, um, if you were faced with the choice of getting grandma a, a laptop, a um, couple example things you'd look at for why you would choose a particular laptop. How many of you would choose it because of the specs on the left? Anybody? 
Anybody? All right. Maybe it's a really good value. Maybe, maybe it's a really good cost and it doesn't matter. How many of you would get it because you realized that she just wants to look at pictures of the kids on Facebook? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the important thing, you're going you're gonna to have all of these uh, you know, specs and requirements that are customers at the end of the day that kind of jump past the value. And so it's really important to make sure that you're going back and looking at why you're doing what you're doing in the first place, why you're trying to implement what you're implementing, to understand where it is you need to focus your quality efforts. Right? Don't overcomplicate it. Your software is already complicated enough. Yeah, and so, uh, go ahead, okay, Mike, I forgot about that. <coughs> so, uh, so ultimately with the software quality plan, uh, just to kind of describe it a little, it's something that takes as an input the most valuable aspects of the software uh, to your customer and prescribe some activities in a way to apply activities to ensure that those most valuable areas um, are of high quality. And uh, here we have kind of our basic capability subsystem module breakdown. So uh, in the previous slide, I kind of had requirements, uh, other uh, inputs. Um, one of the big things is the things that are valuable to your customer typically are reflected here. Uh, now the question is, what is, is most valuable to your customer? And so, um, in order to have that as an input for our software quality plan, one of the basic ways uh, that you can do that is just through a basic risk assessment. Um, it's, yeah, sure, thank you. <laughs> Pull it back. Okay. So, um, determining what, uh, you guys are all familiar with the risk assessment, but uh, I'm sure, but uh, having consistent criteria that you can apply to different modules uh, to be able to determine what areas are the highest risk um, is an input to describing what methods you need to take to ensure that those areas are of highest quality. And so for an example here, we just have kind of a bottom-up approach uh, of different criteria. And, and actually, this is just an example. You, you, yeah. you will be able to, you know, every one of these plans should be tailored for your customer's project. You don't do one size fits all for a quality plan. Absolutely. You might only want two levels of risk. Maybe you need five. Yeah. yeah. Numbers don't, yeah, don't try to get into the numbers too much. So this is definitely an example. Um, and so uh, once things are, and uh, this is a bottom up example. So uh, here, when things are evaluated at a low level, at a module level, those can flow up to a subsystem or a CSCI or a capability. And, um, and that, that can look something like this. And what that gives you is it gives you uh, consistent criteria that can be applied across the system to get an objective view of what areas are the most valuable to your customer. Because uh, essentially in, in our association here, uh, areas that are of the highest risk um, have the highest risk if there's a software issue in those areas um, to reduce value to the customer. So, so it, you know, it, it, we go back to the you still have to know where to start, and you know, every step of the way, you have another question to ask: Where do you start? And so you start looking at the risks, and you realize that you know there's, there's all kinds of criticism you could come up with to try and mitigate those risks, but I say leverage the progress of others and uh, start with known methods of mitigating those risks. And oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> Fun to juggle these. So one of the phrases I've adopted recently uh, is enemies of quality. Uh, I actually owe that to a, a cook, but that's another story. Um, <coughs> a chef, actually. But uh, I kind of boiled down four main areas where those enemies of quality fit. Maybe there's more, maybe there's other things we should consider, I don't know. Definitely want your feedback on that too. But it seems like everything fits into one of these main four areas. Um, so for instance, bad coding practices and constructs. If we go forward to look at some known mitigation activities, coding rules come into play for that. Or maybe you uh, go hire Dan Sack to teach a class to your programmers to make sure they're better programmers in the first place, right? There's Definitely things you can do. You don't need to do everything though, right? But you definitely have a lot of known, proven methods that help you take care of these. And at the end of the day, 
Oh man, sorry for using that. Um, <laughs> what, one, of, one, of the, one of the things you need to, to, to do is figure out how to scope that uh, in your process. And <coughs> I believe actually you wanted to talk about the uh, yeah, plan sure. for that, but I'll let you do that. Okay, and so um, ultimately with a software quality plan, uh, what it is, is it is an application of risk mitigation activities based off uh, the level of risk that you've identified as an input. And so here we have uh, different levels of risk. So for example, if something was lower risk, you might apply a certain activity with a certain level of rigor with higher level of risk. Here uh, in the medium, we have static verification and in high, maybe you need dynamic verification through simulation or something like that. And uh, within the software quality plan, not only does it define the activities, but it, it, it should define the rigor at which you apply. So what's rigor? Well, essentially, if you have uh, 10 stones and there's a problem under uh, one of these stones, how many of these stones do I need to turn over in order to be sure that the problem isn't there? Can I turn over one stone and be eh, not really sure? If I turn over half the stones and there's no problem, can I be reasonably sure? Or is this a high risk area where I need to turn over all 10 stones? And so um, one of the ways, and this is just kind of an example that we came up with, uh, is by using an idea of software quality objectives. And software quality objectives define the rigor of application of risk mitigation activities um, within the software quality plan. So. In fact, this is actually based upon, uh, there's a paper on the web that uh, yeah, was right. worked on already with uh, MathWorks and the automotive in, in, in Europe uh, that actually, not this exactly, but this is kind of just giving you an idea. There is a you know, complete follow through and we're, we're actually, our efforts actually building upon that hugely. Uh, the quality objectives are a great way to apply rigor to a process. Right, so if you have a model that you're applying, or, or a module you're applying static code analysis to, uh, is it something that we uh, need to do a certain level of checks or is it an important GNSC function that maybe you want to prove the absence of divide by zeros? Uh, so by applying a particular software quality objective, you can, um, you can have something that not only you can apply consistently across your system, but it's something that you can, uh, you can tell others about. So it's something that you have in paper that says, this is the activity I'm going to apply. This is the level at which I'm going to apply it. And uh, this is just kind of an eye chart of, of uh, some of those software quality levels of, um, that we have at IVNV for application of static code analysis and traceability between those and uh, different types of issues that uh, we've identified in code. And so um, kind of putting it all together, yeah, so, so I mean, we've already talked about the unrest. It's just kind of an overall flow chart just to give an idea. Um, definitely pulling everything in to propose a solution initially to your customer. You're, you're going to have some risk analysis that goes in, and, and uh, you're going to have to go through your architecture quite a bit to actually do that. And, and uh, so, you know, like I said, we're not looking to solve everything. We would definitely want to be able to reach out, and when, you get your, when Lauren gets her information public, for instance, being able to have that kind of uh, solution available to reference so you can choose what you need, you know, quality attributes, et cetera, makes a lot of sense rather than trying to have everything in one monolithic document. It's more of a getting started guide. Um, and the other thing that's important, really important in fact, yeah. is that this plan should be a living process. You should not write a plan, say do this, and then never change it. Every plan is tailored to a particular project for a particular customer's needs. So you need to make sure that you're going through and reevaluating that as the program evolves too, to make sure that your quality plan is still on target for what you're trying to do. And yeah, and something all, I'm sure people can identify with here, there's a software quality plan maybe of activities you want to apply and then schedule changes or resources changes, or resources change and you can't provide that level of effort. So uh, depending on the new inputs that come into the system, reevaluating the software quality plan uh, when important events happen or uh, periodically um, is the idea to be able to have that kind of a definition. And so what can, what can we provide? How can we help out? Well, IVB, um, we, uh, we talk a lot about evidence-based assurance. 
And uh, speaking of these risk mitigation techniques, one thing that we uh, do have from a history of performing these kind of activities are uh, we have risk mitigation activities described that provide evidence that your system is safe, that the requirements are correctly specified, and go through the entire life cycle phase. Um, from a subject matter expertise standpoint, we just mentioned static code analysis here. Um, uh, static code analysis, it's been around for a while, but it's one of those things that it seems to even be gaining more traction uh, recently. Uh, we have uh, experts that have run many, many tools and are used to configuring said tools and uh, doing everything involved with that. And so it's sometimes difficult to be able to, to spin up your own expertise on static code analysis tools just because of learning curve curve of uh, installing them, configuring them correctly uh, can be difficult, but we can provide that. And finally, we can provide confidence that uh, the product that you're providing to your customer is safe and error-free and meets the customer's needs. So, I got you. I got you. We're good. Good. There we go. Oh, bye. Um, <laughs> so uh, at MathWorks, like I said, this, this, this guide we're working on is meant to be you know, a starting point. Um, Yes, we can help you with the tools. Many of you already use our tool Simulink, which helps with the early on validation quite a bit, simulation, code generation, other verification activities, um, you know, training, consulting, there's all kinds of things we can provide. Um, I will also stress though, we are looking for feedback from others. Maybe there's other things that others can bring to the table to help out with um, that, are, that are gaps going into this guide. Um, and Although I will myself say, yes, you should use something like uh, Polyspace Code Cooper for static analysis, uh, because that's what I work with. Um, I, I will emphasize even more importantly, you should use what you can use to make sure you're getting the quality done, even if that means not using that, right? So uh, do have a good plan in place. I'd, I'd, ra I'd rather have a good plan and do the right thing than not do it and get overwhelmed trying to figure out what to do. Questions? Questions? Yeah. Oh, Chris, hold on. So many. Yeah. <laughs> share this if we need it. You want to be really careful about talking about proving programs, because proving a program safe requires characterizing the operating environment, which you cannot do. That's a. Uh, yeah. You can certainly prove it safe according to a set of assumptions. That that's very true, uh, and, and like I said, it's a, a work in progress. We're not trying to. Uh, you know, say, you, you know, exactly. It is with a set of assumptions. Um, all proof taken into account, a set of assumptions. That's a fair point. Other questions? No? Okay, thank you so much.